Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the new series. This is the ebook series. And I'm very happy to have Elizabeth um, Tasker with us today. Hey, Elizabeth. Hi, can I, thank you for having me on. Oh, very good. Where are you at? So I'm just outside Tokyo in Japan. All right. And so for those who are watching, this accounts for a little bandwidth lag that we have, but it's all good. Um, what takes a Brit to Japan? I mean, as an astrophysicist, I think we move around everywhere. So it's not really that surprising. <laughs> uh, that's a fair enough. I think I've lived in more than one location in my whole life. So, um, yeah, very good. So, uh, let's see, you are obviously in your home office there. Uh, <laughs> You've got yeah, we're still teleworking here. I'm afraid we're in a state of emergency still in Japan. So <laughs> almost all work remains telework. <laughs> okay, very good. Cool, cool. Um, let's see. How are things going pandemic-wise in Japan? Um, hard to say. I think uh, we haven't been as hit as hard as Europe or the States, which is great. But on the other side of that coin, uh, a bit slow with our vaccination program. Okay. So it's going to be a long road out of this, I think. Yeah. Have you been vaccinated yet? I'm not even close. <laughs> okay. Cool. Okay. All right. Um, Elizabeth, what do you like to do for research? So my research is nowadays more or less exoplanets. Originally by trade, I am a star formation theorist. I did my PhD on models of stars forming in galaxy disk simulations. Okay. But in truth, I was always pretty excited by planets. But uh, I was doing my PhD, and this is going to age me because it was in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. There actually wasn't a huge amount going on in the field of exoplanet formation. There were a few groups, but in the UK, there wasn't a huge number of groups, I wouldn't say. On the other hand, there were some really excellent groups doing big, high-powered computer simulations of galaxies and stars. And since I was really excited by programming and performing simulations and basically building a universe in a box, I, it seemed to make sense to go with the UK speciality. Mm -hmm. So I focused on galaxy and star formation, where I did my PhD and two postdocs in uh, the States and in Canada. And I really enjoyed that. I don't have any regrets. But I was always kind of interested in planets and I kept sort of thinking about coming back to it. And then um, I moved to Japan as a faculty member. Oh. And I started off originally not near Tokyo, but in Hokkaido, which is the northern island of Japan, at Hokkaido University, which is in the city of Sapporo, which is most famous probably for the beer. Right. <laughs> Black, uh, label. Black label. Black label. <laughs> And I continued to do galaxy star formation. While I was there, I was approached with the opportunity to write a popular science book. Uh, not the one we're discussing today, but um, uh, Pop Sci, I hope anyone can enjoy. Okay. And they asked me, do you want to write about star and galaxy formation? And I said, no, I don't. <laughs> I really want to do planets. And they said, fine, that's no problem. Um, and I used the book as a stepping stone to you know, put aside the time needed to do at least a small field switch. I mean, yes, it's still astrophysics, but you know, really the papers are very different. So um, writing the Pop Sci book, I was able to do a very broad overview of a wide range of papers on the topic. Cool. And once I did that, which took multiple years, so just imagine some music montage playing here where it all goes quite long in the background. <laughs> exactly. Um, then, uh, then I switched my research over as well. And some of my recent projects have been on machine learning, yeah. looking at how we could make a our best estimate of planet properties we might not be able to measure based on the other planets we know with uh you know related properties the ones we can measure so the uh the transformation is now complete you've done your transformer into exoplanet researcher i i claim so <laughs> every now and again people ask me to review star and galaxy formation papers so i haven't been able to completely sweep that under the carpet <laughs> But uh, certainly my most recent published work is on, on planet formation, and I still do a lot of science communication, which goes quite broadly across sort of planetary and astrophysics. Mm -hmm. Dare I ask if you have another interest that may transform your interest what, yet again into another field? Um, I mean, it's always possible. 
but I don't think so. I really, really do like planet formation. <laughs> I really find it very, very exciting. Cool. So um, I think we'll be sticking here for at least the foreseeable future. Very good. And that is going to bring us to this recent, very lovely IOP, AAS ebook, Planetary Diversity. Rocky Planet Processes and Their Observational Signatures. And Elizabeth, take us away. So this book um, is written by a team of a mix of us. I'm an astrophysicist, uh, so is Yuka. But I think Heyman, Stephen, Matthew and Hilary would describe themselves more as planetary scientists. And many of our authors are actually on the geoscience end of that. So we're quite a interdisciplinary team. And that was very intentional. What we started to feel was that originally when exoplanets were discovered, you only saw them as shadows. You see them as you know, the transit or the radio velocity technique. And you get a size from that, either a radius or a minimum mass measurement if it's a radial velocity measurement. Mm -hmm. And you don't get anything else about their properties. You just get their physical size, normally just one measurement of that and their orbit. So based on the star, you can then say, OK, here's the instant level of radiation. But that doesn't tell you anything about the planet itself. I mean, we know this from our own solar system, you know, Mars, Earth and Venus don't really have that different orbits, but they're wildly different on the surface. So you haven't really got a lot of information there. However, we're really at a brink in exoplanet science where we, we're going from detecting these planets to actually building instruments and telescopes that are going to start probing their characteristics. And that means techniques such as transit spectroscopy, where mm. the planet is transiting in front of the star, but you're detecting the light that's able to pass through its atmosphere. And by looking at that in a multitude of different wavelengths, you can get a clue to what elements might be in the atmosphere doing absorbing that uh, makes a transit change slide size very slightly when you look at it at different wavelengths. Uh -huh. yep. And although that's going to be the upper atmosphere, it is our first real clue of what's going on with the planet itself. But at that stage, you hit a bit of a problem. And that is, I can tell you as an astrophysicist, I have never sat a geology course. I think maybe I did a little bit in high school, but I did, you know, certainly for a Brit, I did the classic physics, chemistry and maths in my final years of high school. I went on to university where I read physics and I specialized in astrophysics. So, you know, shadows are what I understand, like hard ball bearings that orbit stars with gravity. No problem. I've got that down. <laughs> but you're actually talking about a system where that data that we're receiving from the upper atmosphere is this complex combination of, you know, the geology of the planet, the magnetic field, its composition. It's, I, there's, there's a huge list, but obviously, as I said, astrophysicist ball bearing going around a star, I'm not even familiar with every single process that's going to be going on to getting us the final molecules in that upper atmosphere. Right. So that means if we actually want to understand what that data is telling us, and in particular, if we want to try and go from the top of the upper atmosphere to understanding what's happening on the surface, we need a really good understanding of the planets, I, all the processes. So the geological processes, the chemical processes, the physical processes, even the biological processes. Mm -hmm. And if our ultimate aim is one day to be able to say, yes, that planet is habitable. So we need to know what it's like on the surface or perhaps even more to say that planet is inhabited and we have a biosignature on our hands, we're going to need to really understand all the abiotic signatures that could produce upper atmosphere composition that we're seeing. And there's a bit of a bridge um, to cross here because exoplanet science until recently has mainly been the jurisdiction of astrophysicists and not of planetary science or earth scientists. Mm -hmm. So we have this group of people with a huge amount of expertise in how planets work and their inner mechanisms, but they're typically going to different conferences, they're publishing in different journals, and they're not used to dealing with exoplanet data. Most of my planetary science friends, I mean, they deal with in situ data. For the earth, obviously we have a huge amount of that, but even for planets like Mars, where you know we haven't explored really very much on the surface, we still know vastly more than anything we can get from an exoplanet or anything we're likely to get in the next 10 years or so. So you need to bridge this gap between astrophysicists who understand the data 
and then planetary scientists who understand the processes that are going to create that data. Mm -hmm. And that was the idea for this book. We wrote it really for the two groups to try and say, mm -hmm. this is the background that you might not be aware of because you're reading different journals. You haven't been um, to these sort of conferences. So here's a broad overview to say, OK, you've got a rocky planet. What's next? Mm -hmm. Good. Very nice. So did this uh, did this idea for this ebook, did this just sort of pop out of the blue of a recognition of this? Was it driven by uh, a workshop or a conference where you happened to get the two groups together or multiple? It was actually driven. It was driven by several conferences where this problem was trying to be tackled. We had um, an E.ON workshop at ELSI. ELSI is the Earth Life Sciences Institute. It's um, an institute within Tokyo Institute of Technology in, here in Tokyo. And Mathieu, um, one of my co-editors, led that workshop. Uh, with exactly this goal in mind to try and bring astrophysicists and planetary scientists and earth scientists together to start to look at the possible diversity in rocky planets because one of the problems we've got is while we might understand the earth it's very unlikely we're going to get an exact earth even if we found another habitable planet in the so-called habitable zone of its star so it's receiving similar amounts of starlight small changes can make a big difference Indeed. You know, perhaps you have less or more iron in the core that's going to affect the magnetic field. Perhaps you have a larger or smaller planet. Perhaps your composition of your mantle is different. And therefore the heat conduction from that core to the surface is going to change. These could all be very small differences that mm. even if you form the solar system from scratch, the stochastic nature of that process might give you a slightly different planet. And we have to be prepared to say, how will that change the observational signature? So uh, Mathieu organized this workshop to start to bring together these groups. And that's actually where I met most of my co-authors, in fact, on this book. And this was also picked up by other workshops. We attended one in Wyoming, uh, looking at um, habitability of rocky planets, where again, these groups were being brought together. So it was certainly a topic that more and more people were becoming aware of. And then it was at this Wyoming conference during the conference dinner, uh, I sat next to someone from the ebook series, uh, Dawn Gelano, who said, hey, you know, you're very passionate about this. How about actually putting it on paper or e-paper and, and writing a book that could be an example of what you're talking about and people could point to and say, OK, this is how to start getting into interdisciplinary science with a, an overview of you know, both the astrophysics and the planetary science that we might need to know when dealing with the data that we're going to collect in the next 10 years. Cool, cool, <clears throat> very nice. Um, <clears throat> would you like to start off with, uh, with the YouTube video or would you like to? Yes, yes, so I actually designed a video so that um, I wouldn't keep forgetting all the main points. <laughs> and so people could quickly see what this book was about. And it probably explains what I've just said, but I'm hoping far more succinctly and with pictures. So there's a lot to like about this. So please, if we could play that, that'd be wonderful. And here we go on YouTube and there's Elizabeth's channel. Go ahead and subscribe and let's play this three minute, three Can minute. We, yeah. We're just gonna let it roll in its entirety. Planetary diversity, rocky planet processes and their observational signatures. A new text for interdisciplinary researchers engaged in the characterization of the nature of planets and exoplanets. To date, we have discovered many planets beyond our sun whose size is similar to that of the Earth. However, it seems very unlikely that this similarity would extend beyond the bulk mass or radius of these new worlds. Orbiting around stars with different chemical abundances compared to our sun, these exoplanets may have rocks formed with quite different compositions compared to those commonly found on the Earth. The planet may also acquire a smaller or larger internal heat budget from varying abundances of radioactive isotopes or from a different collisional history. The amount of volatiles is also highly unlikely to be a constant, depending on factors varying from the planet's formation and location relative to the snow lines in the planet-forming protoplanetary disk through to the architecture of the planetary system itself. Variations in the rocky composition of the planet change which minerals are formed in the crust and down through the planet mantle. This affects properties such as viscosity and how easily heat is transferred from the planet's center up to the surface. 
This can impact the formation of properties of the planet core, which in turn impacts the generation of the planetary magnetic field. Mm -hmm. A weaker magnetic field can boost atmospheric loss due to interactions with the stellar wind. Such loss may also be strongly impacted by the atmospheric composition. The planet's lithosphere, comprising of the crust and uppermost mantle, may form a relatively rigid stagnant lid, or something more mobile. On Earth, the lithosphere is broken into discrete blocks to form our planet's tectonic plates. Which of these occurs will strongly impact heat circulation through the planet and affect processes such as volcanic outgassing and hence atmospheric evolution? As we enter the next era for exoplanet science, where telescopes will not just detect the planet's presence, but also aim to measure their atmospheric composition, Understanding how these processes occur and connect will be vital for deciphering how the gases in the atmosphere relate to conditions on the planet. Moreover, without a thorough understanding of the abiotic processes a rocky planet can manufacture, the hint of life will be impossible to determine. This volume considers how a planet similar to the Earth will change under variations of magnetic field strength, internal heat budget, composition, and volatile abundance. The book is aimed at researchers exploring the potential diversity of rocky planets and the characterization data from our upcoming generation of instruments aimed at worlds beyond our sun. Okay, I have to ask, who did the artwork for that? That was me. You, that is an awesome job. You did a very good job with that. Congratulations. Thank you. It's it is using software. I didn't physically draw it on a chalkboard. I, but, just, um, I used to... fantastically precise. <laughs> yeah, really good. And I get it the same every single time as well. No, it's um, <laughs> it's actually a, a program called Doodly and you can import your own images and then it basically reveals them in a way that you dictate. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to use yeah, and it's, well it's quite fun to use. Yeah, you did that well done. I, I, I have a little penchant for illustration so I can appreciate the work that went into that. Um, tell you what, why don't we, uh, why don't we walk through, let's just say, let's just walk through the first couple of pages, at least to the index and walk through actually a little bit more in detail on what the contents of the, uh, the ebook is. We're not gonna go through all 265 pages people, uh, but it is free if you, if your library subscribes to the IOP journal, so you can pick it up and use that in your classes or get into the field a little bit. So let's just walk through this a little bit. Uh, it's the IOP ebook. They're sort of, uh, hey. There you go. There's the seven corridors uh, of the AAS journals. A little bit about the AAS, a little about the editorial board, Steve Kowaler, who we just did a video on on ebooks about uh, three, four weeks ago. You can put that link in the video. Planetary diversity. Uh, and yes, just in disclosure, uh, both Steve and Hillary are uh, at my home institution, I actually came in as, as well. So three out of six are at Arizona State University in disclosure. And this one came out in 2020. Yeah, this was December, 2020, yeah? And then contents. Uh, okay, Elizabeth, why don't you talk a little bit about uh, each of the main major major chapters in this ebook? Yeah, so we have um, two introduction chapters, uh, which are the two I was most involved in. And they're very much from the astrophysics perspective, which is why I was involved in them. And the first one is looking at the kind of data that we're going to be dealing with when we start to move from detection of these planets through to characterization. So actually the largest section of that is um, section 1.3. So section 1.1 and 1.2 talk about really detecting planets, how we've been detecting them and what data we get from that. Do we get a radius? Do we get a minimum mass? Um, how accurate can we be on that? And what have we learned so far from that information? And then 1.3 goes on to what we're really just starting to do now in the exoplanet community, which is to look at techniques that can start to go 
beyond just size to say something about the planet. So missions like Kiops, which are mm. going to get accurate radii for planets where we already have a minimum mass, so that gives you a density, through to uh, telescopes designed to look at transmission spectroscopy, direct imaging, and other techniques that can provide something about the composition of the planets, normally in the upper atmosphere, and sometimes looking towards the future where we might be able to know a little bit more about the surface. Oh. And then the second chapter is quite a short one. It just does an overview of how we think planets form. And this is a broad base simply because all the other chapters are going to be assuming that knowledge effectively. Like it's really an overview. You start off obviously with a star. It's got a protoplanetary disk around that, which has got microscopic grains of dust. There is a fairly complex involved collide and stick process where you go up to planetesimals and then protoplanets and then planets. And then finally you have a rocky planet and then it itself starts to operate as its own, um, I don't want to use the word alive when I'm talking about abiotic, <laughs> but it starts to operate with its own internal processes, you know, for the iron sinking to the core as the planet differentiates and you go through a magma ocean phase. And at the end of that, you have really the starting planet for the next set of chapters. Uh, so this is really like, okay, this is, this is where we're starting. We've formed a planet, we know it's rocky, what's next? And then what we have here is a series of dials where we take the earth or a planet that is similar to the earth as our starting point, And you're going to change one thing and ask what happens to the planet? So the first one we do is the magnetic field. Like what, you know, what causes a magnetic field? Do we always expect them? What might be different if we change small properties of the planets? And I should emphasize, we don't go too far from the earth. So what I think is very surprising about this book is all these planets are earth-like. We're not actually changing all that much about our own planets. And yet you end up with a huge number of variation of what might come out. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that underscored why this book was important. Like it's not enough to say earth-sized in the habitable zone, we have an earth. Mm. We have to say, wait a minute, even a small change on the earth can affect a huge amount. Even a small change in the history of the earth can make a very different internal structure and it's going to affect all the things that make our environment what it is. So yes, our first dial is that magnetic field. Like how is it formed? Do we always expect it? What might change it? Uh, what about the other magnetic fields in our solar system? Because we do have some examples we can look at in situ. So obviously the Earth, Mercury has a weak magnetic field. Mm -hmm. uh, Mars once had a magnetic field. Venus is as per usual a giant question mark. And there's some evidence for the moon and obviously Ganymede, the moon of Jupiter has a magnetic field. Um, and then yes, discussions and future prospects like how might you detect a planet with a magnetic field or maybe inadvertently find it does not because of atmospheric loss or similar processes. Okay. Good. So we have Chong Fei on that chapter, who's an expert on atmospheric loss and has done quite a lot of modeling to say, okay, if there's no magnetic field, how long is that atmosphere going to survive? Mm -hmm. Questions like that. Cool. So our next knob, our next dial we're going to turn is heat budget. Now, most of that is um, not so much heat from the star, but more, heat from within the planet. So when you form the planet out of rocks, you're going to have an abundance of radioactive isotopes and they are going to provide a lot of your internal heat budget. Mm -hmm. And what happens next depends on, turns out a variety of different things, like how much you have to begin with, but also how easily it can escape. And part of that will depend on whether the planet forms plate tectonics or not. Mm -hmm. If you have a solid lid, it's much harder to get that heat out. Uh, and we don't know exactly whether a planet is likely to form plate tectonics. We only have one example in the solar system. Yep. So you know, how common is this? It's, it's a big question. So this team actually did a lot of modeling and they actually modeled both static lids and um, non-static lids and asked, okay, how long is that heat going to stay in the planet? Eventually the planet will go cold. Uh, you know, what's the sort of time scale for that? Mm -hmm. And they also did some variations where they changed, you know, you, you have this uh, straightforward model and the code for that is all available online as well. Probably. And you can play with um, 
different inputs to find out how that changes your your planet's evolution. Nice, good. Okay, B and uh, so our next we got composition. Yeah, our next change is going to be the composition of rocky planets. So we know from our observations of the star themselves that not all stars are equal. <laughs> Some are definitely more equal than others. And in particular, they have different abundances of elements. Now, if one assumes that that would then be reflected in the building material around the star that ultimately forms the planets, you would expect stars of different compositions to form planets of different compositions. So again, the question is, you know, how does that actually change the planet? Like, what do we expect based on stellar abundances? What, how do we expect that to be transmitted into the planetesimals? Some observational insights we have there is the polluted white dwarfs, where you see evidence of planets uh, basically being shredded and falling into the white dwarf. And then you can actually see that observationally. Uh, and then the consequences, we have a few extreme outliers there, but also, a lot of this is uh, still based around uh, Earth-like planets. You know, how does that change magma oceans, core formation, viscosity of the mantle, which of course affects heat escape and uh, therefore the evolution of the planet. Good, good. And then our final, final knob we get to play with is in some ways related to number five. It's also composition, but it specifically looks at volatiles. Um, and that includes obviously water, but the team also looked at a number of other volatiles, including sulfur. And they looked at the solar system and said, well, are all these planets identical? Um, and on the surface, no. And then you can dig a little deeper and say, OK, was the delivery different or are they actually more similar than we thought? Um, so that gives us a, a feel for the causes of volatile diversity. And then um, we can look at particularly at water and how the snow line, which is the point where water freezes into ice and can therefore be incorporated more easily into a planet, how that evolves with time and whether we'd expect the same uh, for different planets forming around different stars. Uh -huh. yep. So there are, your four, there are your four dials you get to play with with these books. You've got magnetic fields, you've got heat budget, you've got composition, mainly rocky composition, and then you've got the volatile composition. And we all start with a basic Earth-like planet, and then you adjust that dial very slightly, and it's quite amazing that the changes you can get even from those small adjustments. Yeah, and this is uh, basically you're taking each of these knobs and dialing them independently, uh, but of course there's going to be sort of a very nonlinear, complex system between them, uh, which would make it even more diverse. I would think. Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. And the chapters do cite one another, but of course, the real world is always more messy. So um, ultimately, you're, yeah, you've got all these knobs going at once. Mm -hmm. Very nice, very nice. I think it's, uh, I mean, I've gone through it. I think it's a very nice uh, addition. And um, certainly I would say on time scales of <clears throat> decades, let's say, uh, I'll be looking forward to Planetary Diversity 2. <laughs> yeah, someone else might be writing that, I have to be honest, but <laughs> this, this might be my one contribution to this topic. <laughs> very good, very good. But I think it would definitely be, um, once we start getting real data, because all of this is done through models and simulations. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's not totally true. Of course, we have the solar system, and we made a very clear point in pulling in solar system data into each of these chapters because we do have diversity in our solar system. And if we throw that data out, then, you know, what are we doing? That one's peril. Uh, we have to consider the earth and all our solar system planets because they're the only in situ data we'll probably ever get. So any model has to be able to explain those planets before we start tackling the planets around other stars. Uh, and, but yes, once we start getting, you know, a lot of data from potentially rocky worlds, then I think uh, Rocky Planet Diversity 2 would definitely be something I would want to read, if not write. <laughs> uh, Rocky 2 sounds like a movie. Um, yeah. yeah, very good. Obviously, Rocky 1 would be the superior one, but uh, you know, clearly, sequels clearly. sometimes are good. <laughs> <laughs> the original has always got a special place in one's heart. So, exactly. <laughs> very good. 
Elizabeth, I want to thank you so much for taking some time and, and uh, walking us through there. your really very nice uh, ebook, Planetary Diversity. So thanks. Thank you very much. And I hope it's useful for people. We wrote it really with the aim of anyone who is grad student and above in mind. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe stepping on a bit too far for an undergraduate, perhaps, unless you're in a final year. But if you're a graduate student and you're interested in exoplanets or planetary science diversity, and you're a bit worried that your speciality wasn't broad enough, then we wrote this book for you to um, tell you about the different topics and where to find that information. So it's not the full stop in the topic. It's, it's a starting point to say, OK, these are the factors you should be considering. And you know, this is a sort of place you can you can search for them and find out more information. So, you know, I, th I think interdisciplinary science is amazing. And I really hope that people are excited by the prospects of really finding out really what's out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a good kickoff. And then, of course, you know, stay on top of the field. You want to um, take a look at the current literature. And so it's a nice, it's a good intro into, you know, staying up on the current literature on what, uh, what part yeah, of Yeah, absolutely. So with, with my own field in astrophysics, um, obviously with the other chapters, I was the editor, but I wasn't the writer. Mm -hmm. And what I told my co-authors was, okay, you know, your target is to get it past me. If I can understand it, You've got the great interdisciplinary level. <laughs> but there were there were difficulties with that. I mean, people, you know, normally we work within our own fields and we forget what jargon is. Yeah. We just think of its regular words. And sometimes they are regular words, but the meaning changes. Mm. Uh, I remember having quite a famous debate at LC one time when none of us could agree on, on this journal paper we were reading. And then someone went, wait, stop. When you say planet surface, what are you talking about? And everyone around that table had a different definition of what they thought the surface was. There you go. And that's why we were disagreeing. And I had similar ones where I was reading um, part of the composition chapter and it had been very well written, but um, the author for that section had used the mineral names. And I knew the names were familiar, but I couldn't tell you what their composition was. And I couldn't understand why the change was important. So any paragraph that began because quartz was instantly lost on me. I mean, I could probably recognize quartz, but it doesn't have any, any because quartz isn't gonna take me anywhere good. <laughs> so I had to say, could we put the chemical elements in brackets? Yeah, exactly. And then say oh, the why the change to quartz was important. <laughs> oh, it's got some carbon in there. Okay. You, I mean, really? you know, was completely news to me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the patience of my co-authors in me just writing and saying, I, I, I don't know what this mineral is, I'm so sorry. And them saying, no, it's really no problem. Don't worry, we'll, we'll put the chemical elements, we'll put some explanation in. Goodness. And just patiently rewriting, probably at a level they haven't had to do since grad school themselves. So we really tried to make it accessible interdisciplinary. Right. And I think that, you know, I think we did really well. And I'm really amazed by the patience of the people I worked with. Yeah, it's a great volume. So let me ask, uh, so from when the idea sprouted uh, of putting that ebook into when you actually saw it out in public, um, what was that time scale? Was that time scale a few weeks? Um, <laughs> we just knocked it back, Frank. It was no yeah, just... no, um, <laughs> it was It was about two and a half years yeah, um, from when I signed the contract with IOP to when it was actually, I mean, on shelves, it's a new book, but you know what I mean? It mm -hmm. was actually out. Um, we had, what we did is once we, our editorial team formed a group of authors. And once we had them, you know, commit their firstborn to us, we, we then pulled everyone together for a conference. And we sat down and we sort of thrashed out, okay, this is the level we want to write at. This is the scope of each chapter. This is how they're going. This is what everyone else is doing. So just sort of keep an eye on that. Um, and then we did it mainly online because we were very, uh, we were not only interdisciplinary, but also intercontinental uh, from different countries. So we worked largely online. And then of course, you know, a world pandemic happened. <laughs> so we originally had plans for a second workshop and that really wasn't going to happen. Yep. And we also had other issues that I just didn't see happening. Like for instance, um, the government in the US had a shutdown for quite a long period of time yeah. and it froze all grants. So we were applying for grants for our original workshop and we were pretty confident that we were going to get this particular grant. We really sort of nailed the topic. We should have been a, almost, I mean, nothing's a shoo-in with grants, but 
we really did feel that we were we had a really good chance with this particular grant and the government shut down nothing could happen so we had this problem where do we do we stay or do we go do we just give up at this point because we haven't got the funding to bring anyone in and fortunately it was steve that saved us all so i woke up one morning feeling rather stressed and sort of checked my phone blurrily from bed and i had a message from steve that just said can you call me now because of course we had you know the time difference we were working with tokyo and arizona so i sort of blurrily rolled to my computer and you know hit skype <laughs> and uh, steve said i can do it i can fund the workshop we have to downsize slightly we're going to have to invite slightly less people but fortunately arizona itself has a really diverse team working in this area so if we hold the workshop in arizona we can save on costs because we have the expertise in house yep very nice and and we did it and yeah. you know that was from a problem that we just didn't see coming and then of course the pandemic happened which no one saw coming so you know we were really lucky that we were all able to continue to work during that and we were all able to continue to do our sections but it felt like you were sitting on a time bomb because at any moment things could get really bad for any individual yeah so yeah. you you were building these chapters hoping that everyone could stay on board but knowing that it just might not be possible uh, but did, we did it did <laughs> everyone everyone stay together everyone stay real everyone stayed together um, it was a small miracle honestly uh, and yeah, it, it, there were some points where people sort of vanished and came back and it was just inevitable. You're like, mm. yeah, you know, there, there were bigger things going on than even Rocky Planet diversity, I have to say. Yeah. So yeah. I think it was a huge yeah. credit to the commitment of the authors to say, no, we want this to go ahead. It has to be now. It can't be delayed. This book is topical at the moment and it needs to come out. Yeah. And I think people prioritize that in their hectic work schedules, which were, you know, operating all over the place from home, from their, you know, while babysitting their children, while, you know, looking after their neighbors. It, I, really? I have really no words for how hard it must have been for some people. And um, I hope they're as proud of this book as I am. Very good. Thank you, all co authors. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right, I think that'll do. And Elizabeth, I want to thank you again so much. Thank and you. thank you, everyone. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.